Okay, please welcome our speaker. <laughs> okay. um, good morning, and thank you for a very nice and long introduction. <laughs> um, of course, first of all, I have to thank our organizers for inviting me for such a great opportunity today. And so, since I'm still a researcher, so I will be more in the technical details of, of the work. And so, I was trying to share with you the development of the work that we have accomplished during the past two years on the development of electrochemical sensing platform for cervical cancer detection and diagnosis. Uh, okay, let's see. All right, um, so the talk today, I will start off with some kind of introduction of our flagship program, which is um, the program where we're actually working on some particular um, projects at Nanotech. And then Sina will be talking about cervical cancer, so we'll um, explaining and giving an introduction into the cervical cancer diagnosis. So get ev everyone in the same pace of what typical um, conventional techniques is and what kind of drawbacks and what we're trying to improve. And then um, I'll go on to the second part, which is the automated um, electrochemical sensing platform, which is the platform that we have developed for, for the past two years. Um, and the results in terms of the lab test, where we're testing it with the purified proteins and the cell lines of cervical cancer cells. And also um, a very recent result on the clinical test, where we actually get the sample patients and then, and then um, test the system. And then the uh, final two um, topic will be a very current result that we have on the signal enhancement technique where we're trying to improve the abilities of the sensors. And then the end is the automated platform that we're still ongoing. And because of those, we're trying to see if we can actually push it to the clinical setting. And then final conclusion and some future perspective. So um, Cindy mentioned about the flagship program, so I'm just going to introduce a little bit that you know, Na Nanotech just celebrated our 10th anniversary um, last year, I think, I believe in August 2013. And so um, Professor Zira, the director, has launched this 10 flagship programs where um, they're actually divided into four different clusters. Um, there's agriculture and food, health and medicine, energy environment, and industrial production. So um, CINEM actually have a majority work onto this smart health flagship programs where in is in the health and medicine um, clusters. So here's the faces of the teams. Um, Professor Tararat here is a flagship manager. So she actually overseeing the programs of this smart health flagship programs. Um, I'm working on this particular cervical cancers um, projects. So the objective of the program is we're trying to do research development in trying to get the integrated nanotechnologies in to improve the diagnosis and also you know therapies of the major diseases in Thailand. Um, we have two, three different um, subgroups, cervical cancers where we're focusing on the disease and development of platform for high performance diagnostic and treatment. Diabetes where people are looking at developing a biosensor as well, but to looking at the glyca um, glycation level instead of looking at the glucose um, level. And then the tuberculosis where also they're doing rapid tests, point of care tests. Um, so I will go ahead explaining these cervical cancer sub programs. So we basically have uh, three different teams. Um, the first team which is um, I'm he heavily involved is we develop the diagnostic test. Um, imaging system where a, people, a group of researchers are working on to create a real-time in our first and imaging system to actually, you know, imaging the cancers. And then um, the last group where they're doing teranostics, so doing MRI and interpreting contrast agent. And so today we will focus on the diagnostic test. So the question is, well, why we are so keen on looking at cervical cancers? So if we're looking at the, you know, key statistics of, from WHO, these maps are actually, it's color coded. So it's actually showing the cervical cancer incident rate per 100,000 um, women, I, I believe, per years. 
So you can see from the color that, I mean, most of the incident rate are actually occur in less developed country. Um, of course, Thailand is well included here, unfortunately. So we don't really like the odds of the number much. So, but I mean, it's not as is, it's, it's very local to Thailand, but it's actually around the world. Um, cervical cancer actually considered second most common cancer in women worldwide. And you won't believe that there's half a million new cases every year. So it means every year people have been diagnosed with cervical cancers. So you, you can imagine how, how many patients are actually increasing every year. And in Thailand, well, um, in particular Thailand, there's more than 50% mortality rate, which um, put into pictures of that if you have 100 patients with diagnosed, more than half of those people will actually die from cervical cancer. So it's, it's very unfortunate. But um, one of the well, good news is that if we have early detection, you can actually prevent 75% of cancer developing. So it's basically um, kind of a reason why we're actually you know, s trying to start and doing the early diagnosis of the cervical cancers. So now start looking at um, these cervical cancers to you know, get an understanding of why we are actually doing some of the diagnostic the way it is as is now. So people had been doing a lot of studies and their strong belief that you know, the HPV, which is the sexually transmitted virus, actually have a strong association with the cervical cancer development. So HPV infection will basically um, happen in almost a lot of people. And by having an infection within weeks, they will have a development of the viral uh, replications. And those will actually get an in infected um, cancer cells, I mean cervical ca cervix. But then um, most of the people are actually will heal within two years. So basically 85% of infection, you know, you can self-eliminate it within two years. But unfortunately, some of them will actually, you know, have an oncogenic transformation and then go to the cervical cancer cells. Um, so with these, if we look at the progression of the cells, so you start off with the normal cervix, so you see the, the cells are, are healthy and normal. And then when it starts to actually, you know, creating the oncogenic transformation, which, which means virus was infected and you actually develop the cancer cells. Um, they actually divided the stage into basically four different stages or, or three different stages if you look at the cell. So in cytology, you actually separate into the low grade, which is kind of like an early stage. It's not developed the cancer yet, it tend to be the cancer in the future. And the high grade, um, so it's how high so. So it's, it's a high grade where it's actually more severe. And then the last part is invasive carcinoma where it's actually developed with cancers. So um, for these um, typical conventional pap tests, we're actually looking at the morphology change here. So this is the image of the cell that collect from the cervix and then you know, having a cell staining. You see the development that what people look at, uh, so cyto screening are looking at, is actually the change in the ratio between the nucleus and the size of the cells. So if it's progressed severely, you will see you know, mostly if it's the, the nucleus are actually occupy all of the cytoplasm um, area. And that's it actually how, actually how conventional PAP tests are being done. So people are looking at these by the cyto screener. So you actually have to rely on technician. And there are also more um, recent development that, that shows that HPV, which is m more particular type, like looking at six HPV 16 and HPV 18, which is the two type that um, they call as high risk um, HPV or oncogenic HPV, where these two are the most responsible, almost 70% that develop cancer. So if you look at the map here, the Bright green here is, is HPV-16, so you see it's mostly strong relation of HPV-16 with the cervical cancer is more than 50%. And collaborate with the HPV-18, so that's actually the most two that are very common. So based on the previous um, 
data I showed, or the introduction I mentioned, there, the diagnosis today will, will involve the PAP test, which is looking at the cell morphologies, and the HPV test, which is actually looking at the DNA of the virus. Right, so um, this is just a, a basic diagram of the flow chart when, when actually doctors comes in. You actually look at the two results. If, say, if it, um, this one is mean you actually have both positive, so HPV are also positive, and you also have PAP positive, then the doctor will send you to colposcopy. So actually, to looking at um, under the cameras and you know, and, and taking the, uh, the samples, and if it's negative for PAP but positive for HPV, which means you actually have a risk of you know having um, developing a, so cancers. So you can either doctor will either do you know having a a co-test repeat in a years, or just doing the genotyping to see if it's a high risk H HPV. So if it's 16 or 18, then that will go on. And the last one, if it's all negative, then it will be another five years that you have to come in for another diagnosis. And all these are actually, you know, taking a lot of you know market in in the U.S. or in around the world. And so. When we look into the more details of what it is, we start out with sample collection, so it's the cell collecting from cervix. The PAP test, we actually smear all the cells on the glass slides, right? Um, sample preparation, it means when it's smear, then you basically lose almost 80% of the cell that you collect, because not a lot will be on the, on the samples, on, on the slides. And then the cell standing process, and in the end, the cell um, abnormality observation will be done by by a specialist, so you have to be trained. It take, if I remember, like almost a year to train to be able to be a good reader on this. But still, it's still subjective, right? Because it's it's human um, to read it. So so far, there has been um, a development in the add-on technology, like for example, to use the thin prep. Thin prep is kind of like a solution that help to eliminate all the mucus and blood and everything else in the cells, in, in the samples, so you can get a, a clear pictures of the cells. And that's one thing. And also you can collect almost all the samples because you actually drop it in the solution instead of smear on the glass. And also imaging software is another technology that's trying to develop to you know, accommodate this conventional PAP test where it actually use software to actually looking at um, the specific point on the surface and see if it actually in normal cells. Um, so with all these, still the issue pertaining this um, cervical cancer screening test is that you have possible of a very high fault negative and positive rate, which means even you have the cancer cell, you might not find it using these techniques. Um, very low specificities and of course labor intensive and with the reader, you, it's very subjective to identify what the, what the stage of the cancers. Right. So the alternative technologies that, if you've seen in different um, cancers, tumor markers is, there's a lot of long list of tumor markers that people have been actually discovered that have a strong correlation with the cancer type. Say like if you go to a physical year exam, you probably have to do if you're a guy, they, they probably ask you to do, you know, PSA test, which is the prostate-specific antigen, um, or doing different um, and, um, carcinoembryogenic antigen, which is for colon cancer, for example. So all these tests are basically based on the antibody-antigen interactions, which is going to be more specific to the type of the cancers. So um, for this work, since we have this P16 proteins, which um, it has been studied that it's um, a cellular protein that involved in, in this O expression of cervical cancer cells, um, and it has a direct link to, to the cancer development. So you see this histochemical, and it's stained with the P16 protein. You can see the development of a different um, stage. So the, the more severe of the cancer, you see more of the P16 actually develop. And there also be another um, cancer marker that you know have been introduced to be a different predictive biomarkers, but again, P16 still be the best so far in terms of 
of um, the correlation. If you can see, even as early as SIN1, which is very early on, you would see the positive result at about 72%. So at very early stage, you still get to be able to detect P16 and, and know that it's, you know, start developing cancers. So um, move on then. Um, so for that, with the existing technology, we know we have this biomarker proteins. Um, we have antibody, which is actually produced in-house. And we, with the dual staining, we can actually have a great sensitivities and specificities. So we start thinking of what is going to be a requirement of you know, our ideal sensors. So we have to get a direct biomarkers, which now we think that we're going to use P16. And it has to be a quantitative analysis, right? Um, that's actually the reason why we start going with the electrochemical sensors. And with those, we can eliminate the human variable for interpretation of the cells. And of course, um, there's fast processing time and, and commercialization. So um, let's start off with, with the key component. Um, I would say here is the first examples because um, so far in the literature, I haven't seen anyone actually done the P16 with elect electrochemical sensing yet. So the key element, we actually have this um, screen printed electrode. Um, the reference electrode are actually located there, working electrode, which is the circle part, and this is the counter electrode. So it's normal tree electrode system, right? And another key component is we have this um, monoclonal antibody pair that actually produced in-house that is specific to the P16 proteins. So by combining these two, so I have a movie, I would say, okay. So basically we immobilize all the antibodies onto the surface of, of these electrodes. I will explain more in detail what we um, enhance and, and modify. Then the sample or the protein will come in and, and get um, interactions and then we're using this um, labeling which is the gold conjugated um, antibodies for, for the labeling. So this basically the sandwich type immunoreaction. So we have this one at the bottom and, and the secondary antibodies on the top. So the immunoreaction process in detail will start off with, you know, we, we have this carbon nanotube based sensors. Of course, it's a little bit different than the nanoarray that Professor May Yupan mentioned this morning. Um, it's still in, in the web form, which means we just drop cast it on an electrode. So it's not a well organized um, structures, but it's it could enhance the sensitivities. And then we using this um, surface functionalization, just the um, electrostatic interactions of, of the antibodies and, and the surface that we immobilize to get a positive surface. And then the amino reaction process is actually where the antigen actually come in and, and react with the capture antibodies and then the secondary antibodies on the second. And then finally, the signal enhancement will involve the, the silver enhancement techniques. And then the signal will be actually detecting where um, linear sweep or tomogram. So we're just actually giving a um, constant potential oxidation and then you get oxidation of silver. So um, I'll move quickly into this um, result. Basically, we optimize the carbon nanotube concentration as well to see if at which point you would get a, you know, a very high sensitivities and we end up getting about one milligram per mil. Um, antibody pair is also an, an important key aspect of what kind of um, antibody we use. We have both monoclonal and polyclonal antibody, so we see a different um, change of the using monoclonal and with polyclonal or polyclonal with, an or with monoclonal antibodies. But it seemed that we get a pretty similar results for all. And so we choose to use monoclonal antibody because with monoclonal antibody, you expect that you would get a bit better selectivities for that. So um, optimization will go through with incubation times and you know, signal enhancement effect. Um, incubation time is basically the time that you allow the protein to interact with the antibodies, right? Um, for all those, we get about total with the two, um, two sequence um, incubation is about 80 minutes total. Um, signal enhancement, it ended up to be about 10 minutes. So now the total process is about one hour and a half for all. So with that, we test the sensitivities of the sensors. 
we can go down to about 50 picogram mass detection limit. So the reason I'm, I'm mentioning mass detection limits is because um, when we actually looking at the concentration it actually changed with the how you prepare the sample and dilution. So these mass detection limits will tell you more in details of what actually you actually measure. So I'll go quicker <laughs> because it's only five minutes left. So um, for the sensitivities, we also test with the HeLa cells. So now we go from purified protein, upscale a little bit to, to the HeLa cell, which is the cervical cancer cell line. So with these, we kind of get a de detection limit down to about 30 cells, which is um, we think acceptable for now for you know, moving forward for a, a clinical samples. So now I'm going to start explaining the, the way we're actually doing the clinical, the first clinical trial that we test. So basically, we have a collaboration with the doctors at um, Surat Hospital to collect about 100 samples, and then we test some, you know, to get preliminary results on this. Basically, the sample will collect like typical way of, of pap smears, but instead of, you know, smear on a glass, we actually have this um, solution, a special one that they um, put the cells into, and with centrifugation and sample treatment, you will get um, the samples. So basically, the top one is example of the, you know, the sample pre-treated. So you see how bloody it is and, and the, the mucus and viscosity that actually are totally different from, from the purified proteins. And that is actually the solution is after the, after the treatment. So um, one of the things to kind of note is that with this real sample, real patient sample, you have a lot of things other than the protein. So it's mucus, it's blood, it's white blood cells, and everything that actually comes to get it in a mix, right? So um, the first time we try is we still, instead of, like after collect, collect this sample, we're actually trying to measure the amount of cells and then see how many total cells that would be suitable for, for the differentiation between positive and, and a negative samples. And from these, it's ended up that it seemed that at about you know, 5,000 to 10,000 cells per electrode would be a good range that we get a, different, a good differentiation between the two. And these cells, I mean, the amount of cells is actually the total cells, which means um, is the mixture between the cancer cells and the normal cells. So you probably see the number is very high, but it's actually probably less than 10% of cancer cells in this, um, in this samples. So with that, then we come to the point where we know what kind of dilution we're going to use for an actual um, testing, right? So for, for the test, um, the first test we've done is we've done about you know, 100 samples. And by using the normal PEP test followed by pathology to see what is actually the stage of, of the, the samples, um, we can divide it and do the correlation between our data and, and the stage of, of the cancers. So we divide it into negative, which means there's um, the negative PAP test, SIN, which is actually the early stage of, of the cancers, and then positive, which means you actually, the patient actually have cancer, either adenocarcinoma in situ or, or a, a different type. And so with these, we actually see, you can see that green area here is the current, which is about like 15 microamp that generated from the negative uh, samples. And, and the positive, if we cut off from the early stage, you can see that it's kind of a little bit um, different, that the positive will, will tend to be more higher signal than, than, than the early stage um, samples. And with these, if we actually doing the cutoff value, we would get about 90% sensitivity and specificities for, for this preliminary test. So this is just um, explaining the way we actually calculate the sense and spec, because this will actually, a sensitivity will actually tell you how good of the test to identify the, the positive result. Um, specificity, it will tell you how good it will identify the negative result. Yeah. Okay, so um, the technology benchmarking that we have is, this one is still, I'm not sure is it commercialized, but it's still ongoing research that I, you know, I've been attending, so I saw that they actually use a different um, biomarkers. And for these, 
they would see that you ha they have um, sensitivity and specificity, which is about 90% as well. If you compare to PAP tests where they have a very low sensitivity. Um, that calculated from, from the high so which means a little bit after the, so that you remember they have low sales um, stage and then high sales stage. So if you calculate actually with these um, dual staining, at low seal, you get about 94% um, sensitivity, but still, I mean, less than 70% of, of specificities. So um, based on that, we think that, you know, at, the, at least with the, our preliminary result, our sensors are kind of reliable and we can get a pretty good um, sense and spec for both. So um, right now we are moving on trying to improving the sensitivity by doing a different enhancement techniques. I will probably going to skip this because I, I think I'm time out. But um, just to show you that with these new enhancement techniques, we can actually, we're testing with the standard PSA solution. And you will see the great improvement of the limit of detection that we go from like 20 nanogram per mil down to like 60 picogram per mil with, with these enhancement techniques. So we hope that we can incorporate these um, sense uh, enhancer into the, the previous system and to get a better sense and spec for, for the clinical trial. And just lastly, just want to show um, the latest um, instrument that we built that we're trying to automate this procedures. Because right now, I'm the one who actually drop and, and you know, doing all the, the dropping and then and washing. So now we have this automated system where it's actually relying on these um, auto pivoting where it's actually controlled by the computers so you can control it to actually um, picking the samples and then and then drop casting on the electrode so basically doing all the process that human do and we hope that with these it's going to be you know faster process and get a better sensitivity as well in terms of you know variation that cost from human to do the repeatabilities and so um, just final conclusions with these sensor we can go down to about 50 picogram mass detection limits. Um, with the clinical samples that we tested, we successfully get these um, acceptable, I would say, is higher sensitivity and specificity, about 90%. Um, we're looking forward to do more of multiplexing analysis. As I mentioned, that it will improve the sensitivities. And al also, we're trying to do everything in fully automated procedures. And so, Finally, I'd like to thank all um, people who are involved in this project. Um, uh, Patasuda, is she is a research assistant who is heavily working on this. Professor Tararat, who is a um, you know, project uh, flagship manager. Um, Dr. Satita and Ms. Chaya shown for, for her part on the sample preparation process. Um, Mr. Rungrod for doing the potential stat and, and Professor Somsak, that, who is the doctor at Sirat Hospital who working together with us to collect the samples. And then thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have time for some questions. Questions? <laughs> ah. um, uh, I think I might have missed uh, a little bit of detail. So sure. um, for I, I didn't quite understand the sensing uh, mechanism, mm -hmm. like what happens when the the gold, uh, the gold particles, uh, what happens to the current when the gold particles uh, bind to the okay. biomarkers? Yes, I probably have skipped that for... Um. Okay, so basically, um, when the goal, actually the conjugated goal, which is the level, by to the antigen, which is P16 on the electrode, we have to do this silver enhancement techniques, where we have silver and reducing agent that will, um, you know, code it onto the goal, at goal uh, particles, creating a shell of silver, and that will be um, correlation with the amount of goal that, that present, and of course it's correlated with the amount of antigen on the electrode. And from there, we're actually doing the stripping analysis, so applying the oxidation potential. So you get silver oxidation on the, on, on the electrode, and you actually measure that current. So basically, you 
indirectly measure the amount of proteins by using the gold particle as a label and then using silver enhancement to get the signal. Yes. Oh, well, for this one with the P16 is the, the process of, of detecting the P16. So the uh, the enhancement um, affects the conductivity uh, of the of that plate in the middle. Is that right? Yes. Okay, I see. And uh, do you, you mentioned? Did you mention uh, something about carbon nanotube in some mm -hmm. of the page? Can you make a comment? Yeah, on basically. That? Um, well, the process are involved in. This is a very common process for for um, sandwich immunosensors, right? Um, you can increase the sensitivity either looking at you know, in improving of the sensors, the sensor itself. Like Professor Mayapan mentioned this morning that he actually made this nano ray electrode, and that's one way to improve the sensitivity, right, to reduce noise. Um, this is a very simple and uh, also another way to improve this, the sensitivity by, so this is just a normal carbon electrode screen printed. So the conductivity would be, wouldn't be that high. So what we do is we actually drop cast this carbon nanotube to increase the sensitivity of the surface of the electrode. And so that's where it's come into play. And the second part where you can increase the sensitivity is to looking at the enhancement here. How can you actually get a, a better enhancer to get a better signal out of a very minute or small amount of gold? Yes. Have you ever um, calculated the cost of this technique so we can compare this one with the conventional pap smear? So um, we did some calculation, but of course it's still not um, a cost roughly. for commercialization. But roughly it's, it's um, end up to about 200 baht, which is what? Six dollars. Yeah, six, seven dollars. Um, compared to, well, conventional pap screening in the hospital right now is about 600 baht. But of course, that including, you know, an, another cost like for commercializations and and technicians and a lot of things, right? So these I just calculate from from uh, raw materials. So when it's for a clinical setting, it probably have to be added up a little bit. But it's I don't think it's going to be more than HPV test because HPV test nowadays, if you go in the hospital, it will cost you two hundred. To two thousand baht, I think. So it's about what sixty dollars. Yeah. Yes. And the hospital has to invest this machine. Yes. So that's one of the um, kind of a starting fixed cost, right? So because right now we are looking at the process where I'm actually the one who actually doing the process which I believe with the machine, it's probably going to be a, a starting cost, but in the long run, I'm sure it's going to be cheaper than hiring me who, you know, a PhD and then dropping the samples, right? So, and we expect that with, with these new platform, we can get a faster process and also more reliable in terms of, of dropping and, and mixing. All right, let's thank Dr. Ravi Wan again.